Hello, I'm Christian Mehnert and I'm a PhD student at the Chair for Compiler Construction at TH Dresden. Today I will present to you how we can achieve determinism in adaptive AutoZero. This is a joint work of me with my colleagues Andreas and Geronimo from the TH Dresden, as, as well as Martin from UC Berkeley. Let me first introduce to you what AutoZero is. AutoZero is a worldwide industry consortium and this consortium defines a standard which aims at creating a unified software architecture for automotive applications. This standard covers a set of basic software modules that any application can expect from its environment, and it also defines um, how application interfaces are specified and defines how those applications communicate with, it, with each other. Um, since one goal is to enable multiple companies to jointly develop um, applications for automotive use cases, um, the uh, Autosource standard also defines a common development methodology. Um, Autosar comes in two flavors, so there's, there's the classic platform and the adaptive platform. The classic platform is already widely used in industry and it targets mostly hard real-time applications, so it's quite a restrictive model. A common example here would be the engine controller for car. The adaptive platform targets more newer use cases that are very computation intensive and this targets driver assistance and applications like they are required for the self-driving car. So, so the adaptive platform is a service-oriented architecture. This means that applications are distributed and they are split into multiple software components and those components communicate with, with each other via service interfaces. So they are clients and they are servers and client may acquire a service interface and the server provides this interface. Interfaces are well-defined at design time and they consist of methods. Um, so methods can be called by the client and then the server reacts to them and uh, returns a return value. And events can be triggered by a server and then the client reacts to them. All the communication in AutoZero is handled transparently by middleware. This is uh, the SAMIP middleware, um, but there are also others supported. And this works such that from the service interface description, we can actually generate code and we can generate a service proxy and a service skeleton. And these are used to abstract away all the um, details of the communication mechanism. And then the client logic and the server logic um, only see the service interface and they call methods and they um, trigger events. And they don't care at all how the communication works. This gives quite some flexibility, but um, such a design also has a lot of drawbacks and one of them I, I, we want to address today and this is non-determinism. So how is, this, how is there non-determinism in the system? Well, let's make a simple example. So I have some client code here and this client code um, instantiates a proxy object in order to communicate with the service. And then on the service interface, it calls set value. So it sets some state of the service to one. It then calls add to add two to it. And it then gets the value and prints it. So from the code, it's quite evident what this, um, what this application should do. It should print three. But when we actually run it, it turns out that it might print any value between zero and three. And if we run it multiple times, we actually get a distribution of values. So what's going on here? Well, what's happening is that the method calls are processed asynchronously and they are not necessarily processed in the correct order, which leads to different results. So this simple code is actually broken, although it looks absolutely correct. How can we fix this? Well, we can actually force synchronization. So each of these method calls returns a future object and we can simply call get on it to force synchronization. And this gives us a correct program. But this solution has two issues. The first issue is that we have to do this explicitly. We always have to think about when do we need to synchronize and do this explicitly. The second problem is that um, this introduces unnecessary synchronization because the set and the get method, they both don't have any meaningful return value. 
So why should we wait for the response from the service server? All we care about is that the set value will be processed before the, the, the add method um, by the server. And while we can easily fix the simple code, it get, can get arbitrarily complex. So for instance, we could have multiple client, uh, clients each calling one of the functions. And then it's not clear how we can achieve synchronization here. So we would actually need some coordination between uh, the three clients. And this is not easily, easily doable in Autoser. It's always solvable, but it, it requires some effort by the programmer. So in summary, adaptive Autoser is non-deterministic. And we identified three sources of non-determinism. So the first source lies within software components. So software components are actually uh, not atomic, but they also consist of multiple threads. And this may introduce non-determinism. The second source of non-determinism um, comes from outside of software components that lies in the mechanism how they communicate with each other. And um, there is just no order in which any component should process incoming messages. This is not defined. And the third source is um, the communication mechanism itself. So there is no formal guarantee that point-to-point um, -point message delivery happens in order. Um, for the those that know the standard, uh, they might know um, what the, the deterministic client and think, well, there is a solution for the problem. But having a closer look at the deterministic client, it turns out that it also only solves the first source, source of non-determinism. So the deterministic client is a different way of implementing software components, and it, it indeed solves the problem of non-determinism coming from threads. But it doesn't solve the problem of um, non-determinism coming from uh, the way messages are communicated in the system. So what else can we do? Well, we could choose a deterministic programming model to implement our, our software components and let it handle all the synchronization where it's needed. And this is what we show in our paper. So um, we went for the rector model. Um, the rector model is a rather new model that targets um, distributed systems and that has a rect of nature, so it fits quite well to adaptive autoser. And in the rector model, all the synchronization is implicit. But I can allow synchronous communication whenever I need it. So it's vice versa that as an autoser. An autoser, um, everything is asynchronous and non-deterministic, and I have to enforce synchronization where I need it. And in the rector model, synchronization and determinism is default and I can introduce asynchronous communication and non-determinism if it's needed. So the rector model orders all the events in the system on a logical timeline and uses this logical timeline to, to reason about, about order and when something should happen or in which order it should be executed. So there's a scheduler that maintains the logical time and it triggers all the reactions on the system at the correct time. So reaction something that reacts to an event and processes this event. And each of the reactions, well, it may schedule new events at a future logic time so that the, that the application um, continues execution. And there's a fundamental rule here, so logical time may not elapse faster than physical time. This simply allows us to schedule um, events in a future time that then ha also happen um, with some delay. I will explain that to you in a minute. So all in all, the rector model introduces well-defined well time semantics to the programming model and to the, to the system, um, which allows us to reason about the order of events in the system. So how does all this work? Well, I have an example here of a rector program. And this is actually the example we saw before of multiple clients where each client calls one of the methods set, add, and get on the server. Um, the application consists of three actors 
And these reactors are connected to our ports so they can communicate using this port mechanism. And the blue bubbles here, they denote reactions that implement code. The colored triangles are event sources that may trigger the reactions. So um, when we look at, at the execution of this um, applications, we need to um, look at two timelines. So that the physical timeline and the logical timeline. And let us assume that on the logical timeline, we already have scheduled three events um, at time points T1, T2, and T3 that each trigger the set, add, and get method calls. Um, let's start at a physical time and a logical time earlier than T1. And what happens now is simply the scheduler waits until physical time reaches um, T1. Then it advances the logical time also to T1. And now it sees, well, this yellow event, it triggers the set reaction. So um, it gets scheduled and executed. Note that execution consumes physical time, so it would be at once in physical time, but we remain at the same logical time. The set reaction produces an output value that then goes to the server where it triggers uh, the server's set uh, reaction. Um, so this also becomes scheduled at the same logical time and will then be executed. Now the, com uh, the computation finishes, uh, set doesn't produce any output values. Um, and we didn't reach the physical time, didn't reach yet the time point of T2. So the scheduler again waits until physical time elapses and we reach a point T2. And only then it advances logical time and looks again at the orange event. It sees it triggers the add reaction of client 2. So this becomes scheduled and executed. Then this produces an output value and triggers the add reaction of the server, which we then schedule and also execute. The result, or the, the computation now finishes at a physical time that is greater than our next event, T T3. Um, so the scheduler immediately advances the logical time and triggers the next reaction, so it's get of um, client 3 which then executes, um, this triggers the get reaction of, of the server. And finally, um, because the get reaction produces again a result, this goes back to the client three, it triggers the print from the print reaction. This also shows that um, physical time might um, be significantly ahead of logical time. Um, which could become an issue and therefore the model also allows to specify deadlines which uh, define an upper bound of how far logical time is allowed to lag behind physical time. Okay, let's look at um, another example. So in this case, um, we want to schedule all the events at the same logical time. We again start execution at an earlier logical and physical time the scheduler advances physical or waits until physical time elapses and reaches the time point T1, and then advances logical time to T1 and now triggers our three reactions. And since those reactions are part of independent reactors, they can actually be processed in parallel. This also advances um, physical time, and as soon as all the um, the reactions finished computation, we have three new scheduled reactions because all reactions produces output values, so we trigger all the reactions of the server. And now these get processed. Since um, these reactions are part of the same reactor, there is an implicit order here. So the reactions are dependent on each other and they are executed in order from top to bottom. So we first um, execute set, then add, then get. And get will produce an output value, so it will trigger print, which we then also execute. 
So even if events are scheduled at the same logical time, they uh, will be processed in the well-defined order. Um, so, so far the application I, I showed you is not distributed. So it means it runs within a single process and um, it, it doesn't allow distributed execution. So there's a simple, single central scheduler. Um, now, in order to, to make this work in our server, we need to find um, a solution for having distributed reactors. So what we want to do is we want to take such an application that is implemented with, in one software component consisting of multiple reactors and split it up into an application running on multiple software components. Where we have some special reactors for sending and receiving our messages over the network. Now, this introduces some problems because now each of the software components has its own scheduler. And this means that each of them has its own logical timeline. So we now have multiple logical timelines. And the problem here is that how can we know that it's safe to process events? How can we know that um, the local event queue will not receive any other, any events from coming from any other components? Yeah, so it's difficult to decide for the scheduler whether an event is safe to process or whether it should wait for an event coming from, um, from another component. Um, in order to solve this, we leveraged uh, safety process analysis as it was described in, in Tides and also in other projects. And so let's consider our three timelines. So we have the logic timeline of a sender reactor, we have the logic timeline of a receiver reactor, and we have the physical time or the wall clock time. Um, now let's assume that the sender has some event scheduled at a, at a timestamp t, and this will this um, event will trigger some reaction, which then sends a message over the network. Uh, we need to set up assumptions here. So first, we need to assume that there is an associated deadline with the uh, network port. This gives us an upper bound of the time point of the physical time point at which the send director actually sends the message. So for any event that is scheduled at this time point t, we know at the physical time t plus d that the message um, is sent. Then we also need to assume that there is a maximum communication latency that is known, and this gives us the time point, the latest time point at which um, a message will be received. And then we also need to account for that physical clocks of multiple platforms might be um, not close synchronized, so um, we need to account the maximum synchronization error between those two. So this gives us a time point, a physical time point, at which we know that, at, at which we latest receive any messages that originate from an event at this timestamp t. Later on, we can't receive, we can't receive it anymore. So what we do is we insert this um, this event or, or this new message at the receiver with the timestamp t plus d plus l plus e, because then it will be executed at a physical time greater than this new timestamp. And at this time, we know that there can't be any other events in the network that should be scheduled sometime before. Okay, so um, this enables uh, distributed execution, but it introduces a logical delays for all communication over the network. Okay, so um, since we now have a mechanism for our distributed execution, we can put all this into an approach for implementing reactors in a depth of browser. And this is what we did in our framework. The idea here is to implement the client logic using a reactor and also the server logic using a reactor. And then we use 
service proxies and service skeletons unmodified as they are generated by AutoZone. And we introduce a set of transactors that translate between the reactor interface and the service interface. For this to work, we also modify the sum IP binding so that we can parse um, timestamps to it and send them over the network. Um, all this we packaged in a framework that is available on GitHub if you're interested in it. Let's have a look at another example. This is the emergency perk assistant of the Adaptive Platform Demonstrator, which is the reference implementation of AutoZero. Um, this application resembles a simple pipeline. Uh, we have a camera or video provider that um, resembles a front-facing camera. This camera produces frames at a certain interval and sends those frames to the video adapter. The, the video adapter has a simple task. It just um, translates between the camera protocol and the some IP protocol for the following up components. Um, so the pre-processing component then takes any incoming frames over some IP and it analyzes the frames, so it performs uh, edge and line detection. And um, the goal here is to find the coordinates of the lane that the car is currently driving on. And then forwards this lane inf information alongside with the original frame to the computer vision pro component. And the computer vision pro component um, tries to detect any vehicles in the image and finds those that are on the lane. And it also estimates um, the distance to those vehicles as well as their speed. This information is then forwarded to the EBA component, which um, makes a decision, so decides whether an emergency brake is required or not. So if, if there's a car that is to coming very close, then the brake will be triggered. Now, having a closer look at this application, it turns out that it's not deterministic. Um, so what's going on here? Well, the problem is that those components are synchronized via one slot input buffers. And the assumption of the implication is that each component always reads its data before the data slot is overwritten by the previous component. However, this is not, not the case. This is nowhere guaranteed. And in consequence, data may be lost. So on any of the communication channels, we might lose data items. And in particular, on the between pre-processing computer vision, it might happen that we use data on one of the channels, like on lane or on the frame channel, and then the computer vision uh, component works with misaligned data. We instrument the application to see whether these errors happen in, in a real setting, and it turns out they do. And it even turns out that the error rate that we observe varies with each instance of experiments that we did. So we did a total of 20 experiments. They are visualized in this plot. They are ordered by total um, by the total error rate. And what we see is in, that in some cases, we have over 20% of error. And in other cases, we barely have any. Um, what is also very interesting to see is that the dominant type of errors varies uh, quite drastically. So in some cases, we have a lot of dropped frames at the pre-processing unit. In other cases, we have a lot of dropped frames at the computer vision unit, or at the EBA unit in this case. So this makes it very difficult to even assess how many errors we have and um, what kind of error rate we could expect from the application. So one could say that not even the error rate is deterministic for this application. So um, can we fix this using our, our approach? Yes, we can, and it's actually quite simple to do. So um, what we did is we took the four um, components, so we, we left away the, the um, video provider because we assume that we can't uh, change the way the camera works. And so we changed our four components and we simply wrapped the logic of each component into a vector like, like this. And we only ex exchanged the way those vectors communicate with their environment 
and introduced these transactors, which, um, which they use to communicate and which are connected over the network. For this to work, we also um, need to make some assumptions on, on the values for the deadline of the reactions as well as the latency and some condensation error as we discussed before. So here we assumed a deadline of five milliseconds for the video adapter and the EBA component, as well as 25 milliseconds for computer vision and pre-processing. And we assumed a communication latency of five milliseconds and no synchronization error, since for this example, all the components are executed on the same platform. And with this, we have, with this simple modification, we have the deterministic um, implementation. Now, how can we, now one question remains, and this question is, how do we choose those parameters, the L and the E? Um, so in the example here, we only assumed those values. And to be correct, those values should actually reflect the worst case situation. So D should, be, should uh, reflect the worst case execution time, and um, L is the worst case communication latency, and E is the worst case synchronization error. Uh, those values we can actually get from the platform specification and from worst case uh, execution time analysis for the, in case of the deadline. However, um, there is no need for these values to reflect the worst case. If there are any violations, to the assumptions that we make. So if, if the, the assumed deadline of 25 milliseconds, for instance, is wrong, then what will happen at runtime is that we get observable errors. And we can actually test for these errors and we could deliberately introduce and accept that there are, are errors in the system. So if you have an application that doesn't need to be error-free and where we can accept a certain error rate, um, we can actually choose values that are smaller than the worst case. So for instance, we did this here for the deadline of the computer vision component, and we varied it um, from five milliseconds to, to 15 milliseconds. Starting from 16, we actually have not, did not observe any errors at all. So for instance, if, um, if our application can accept an error rate of, let's say 10%, we could choose a deadline of 11 milliseconds, and thus we reduce the latency and the computation time our application needs. This brings me to my conclusion. So I showed in my I showed to you in my talk that adaptive autosaur exhibits non dynamism in the core domains of its architecture. And I think it became evident from the emergency break uh, Break assistant example that this non determinism may lead to serious malfunction and to may lead to serious accidents. So um, we think that synchronization and determinism should be the default, and this is something we can enable by using the rector model to implement applications in adaptive autosur. And for this, we created a framework that you can use and download, and which is located on GitHub. Um, thanks for listening and I'm looking forward to receive any questions and comments.